Our next speaker is um, Dr. Joe Gahn. Um, You know, we're running a little we're running a little late, and so we're gonna have to maybe cut down part of the um, breakout sessions. But sorry about that. Um, you know, in the, I just wanted to kind of leave you in in these last set of talks with talking a little bit about about science. And I think one of the best people to do that is is Dr. Gan. Um, Dr. Gan's a professor at the um, University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. He's been trained as a clinical psychologist. But what I found really interesting about his work is when you go, you can go to his website at the University of Michigan and he has these wonderful vignettes about um, his work on his, on his um, reservation where he grew up and he combines cultural anthropology, social linguistics, and community psychology to kind of understand Native American experiences. And so he's had this very provocative title today, Reviewing Historical Trauma, Bridging Scientific Skepticism and um, colloquial claims, and I think it'd be a great thing to kind of end with that today before the breakout sessions. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for the introduction, and um, I, I should start off by saying that part of what I talked about um, in um, being invited out here was uh, the opportunity to talk about a little bit of the scientific uh, bridging that might need to happen. I think Ethan Nebelkoff was very helpful earlier today when he talked about the large chasm in the uh, large epistemological chasm between scientific ways of knowing and traditional or indigenous ways of knowing. And I certainly want to echo that I see a chasm like that as well. And the question is whether, in fact, we are, it's possible to bridge that chasm or whether it's desirable to bridge that chasm when it comes to issues like historical trauma. So I've been asked to try and address what might it look like if we were try to, to try to bridge that chasm. Um, and so um, let me see what I have uh, to offer you today in terms of uh, speaking to that, that issue. Um, as Michael said, I'm a professional psychologist, trained as a professional psychologist. I, I'm an academic clinical psychologist, however, which means that I don't see patients. Um, I do research. And in particular, I tend to identify as an applied cultural psychologist. I look um, very funny to many psychologists because I'm half anthropologist in many respects. And in fact, um, I try my best to examine a set of cultural dilemmas at the intersection of conventional mental health service delivery and indigenous custom and practice in Native America. Um, now, um, Theta just said something very interesting near the end of her uh, presentation. She said, you know, we've got to get the numbers. Um, you know, it's the tools of today to be able to justify or validate the kinds of approaches and interventions that Indian country is interested in in order to get the feds like SAMHSA, like NIH, like um, IHS to be able to support and fund some of the efforts that we have interest in doing that. And so if we accept for the moment that it, there it could be some utility or benefit to having scientific evidence to support some of the approaches and practices that we are interested in uh, promoting, then we have to think about what would it look like to try and get that evidence. And so the purpose of my talk today um, is uh, to consider a historical trauma from a scientific perspective, to review some of the basic principles of scientific knowing for us, to try and unpack and offer a bit of a critique of historical trauma as a popular explanation for distress in Indian country, and to try and propose some next steps for achieving scientific legitimacy for historical trauma. Now I'm bracketing for the moment the question of whether it's really desirable and in our interest to do this. I'll return to that near the end. But for now, I just want to uh, respond to uh, the nature of the invitation I received, which was to try and talk about the scientific aspects of this. So you can say this was an explosive presentation. I want to start with a vignette to try and illustrate um, and, and motivate what I have to say to you today. Um, I undertook some interviews on my home reservation, the Fort Belknap Reservation in Montana some years back, um, in which I was interested in understanding drinking, depression, and its relationship to culture in local terms. So this wasn't about to try and figure out what mental health professionals or mental health researchers think about these things. I wanted to try and tap into the local discourse about um, problem kinds of behavior such as this. And I ended up interviewing a number of people, but I focused my interviews on one particular individual who asked to be identified as Traveling Thunder. A Traveling Thunder was a middle-aged, monolingual, Assiniboine Grovant uh, man who was a grassroots activist and a self-identified traditionalist. He was 50-something. Um, he uh, participated in these interviews in part because he was a member of an extended family group that I was interviewing, as well as a cultural authority. 
He himself had no first-hand experience with mental health, uh, but as a self-identified traditionalist, I thought it might be quite interesting to get his perspective on what he thought might be going on with uh, issues like drinking and depression in the community. And in talking with him, what I was able to identify um, was this really um, resonant uh, discourse of distress, is what I refer to it. And it's very similar to a lot of what we've heard today in terms of historical trauma. In particular, he talked about, in terms of explaining where depression and drinking problems come from, four different historical eras. And I just want to review those for you here. The first era, the era uh, of pre-colonial uh, existence that was uh, seen by him to be a paradise, um, was described as follows. See, there was no alcohol on this continent 500 years ago. There was no drugs. There was no problems. Everything was good because everybody lived according to custom and teachings. There was none of that stuff because everybody lived according to a strict custom. And so during this first era, as he described it, what we wanted to recognize as important was that there was this perfect harmony and balance owing to a strict observation of custom. But then, of course, came the colonial encounter yielding conquest. And uh, his description of this era was as follows. But when the white man came, they forced the Indian people to get rid of their way, their religious spiritual beliefs. They forced them to trade their economy. They not only did that, they annihilated them. They rewrote history to suit themselves to justify the bad things they did to the Indian people. It's genocide. And so here we have the annihilation of that very strict custom that gave rise to a kind of a pre-colonial paradise in the colonial encounter itself. The third era, the era of loss, has to do with the post-colonial fallout from that era of, con uh, of conquest. Quote, um, if you don't know your own true oral history, your true oral traditions and customs and where you come from, and what's supposed to be important to you, well, you're going to feel empty. You're going to feel like you don't belong. If people ain't proud of who they are, where they come from, and what they're doing, then they're going to be doing these things, alcohol, drugs. And once you're into alcohol and drugs, you're probably going to get into a depression, and you're going to not feel worthy of being a human being, and you're going to want to kill yourself. So the, the tracing of things here is pretty insightful. It has to do with anatomy or the loss of identity, the loss of who you are, where you belong. That leads to pathology. In a particular, it implicates the white man system, as he referred to it, as pathogenic, that is, the cause of pathology. Finally, he recognized the fourth era, the era in which we find ourselves today, the era of uh, revitalization which is the era, really the remedy for this kind of problem. He described it as follows, quote, after we looked around and realized that we left something behind, we started going back to the hills to fast. We started going to the sweat lodges to pray and sweat. We started going to the elders to learn. We never was happy living like a white man. To me, what a ceremony does is you put up a sacrifice, an effort, and what you're doing is you're calling on the creator, the spirit world, and the grandfather spirits for something, for life, for good health, for a good clean mind, an alcohol and drug-free mind, or for survival even, even survival. So in many respects, Traveling Thunder's solution to the problems of the colonial encounter, the historical uh, uh, injustices that Native peoples experienced, is this return to the very strict sacred custom that motivated and mobilized paradise from the beginning. Now I want to unpack this briefly for us for a minute because I think there are some lessons we want to take home from thinking about what Traveling Thunder had to say here. First thing that's interesting is he outlined a clear developmental pathological process that he said affects community members really to different degrees depending on the community member. You have this loss of identity that leads to substance abuse, that leads to depression, that leads to worthlessness, that leads to suicide. So it was a very nice intuitive flow for how these things might occur. Uh, secondly, um, he talked about this pathological process without much elaboration at all at the level of the individual person struggling with these problems. There's no mention of any of the professionally familiar interests in genes or brain chemistry, troubling childhood experience, maladaptive behavior. In fact, it's kind of remarkable. There's no, there's no biology to it at all, and there's very little psychology. It's relatively non-psychological as a form of explanation. Third, instead um, of the psychological, biological stuff, he did emphasize the pathology producing aspects of the white man system, implicating historical dominance by whites and resultant disruptions in ceremonial tradition in particular as the causes of community distress. So what I want to point out here is that these are observations at the socio-historical and spiritual levels of analysis rather than to the biological, genetic, or psychological levels of analysis. They highlight systemic factors, colonization, over intrapersonal factors, like maladaptive behaviors, for example. They accentuate shared community vulnerabilities, like the suppression of ritual practice, 
over individual deficits like genetic predispositions or chemical imbalances of the brain. And finally, he explained epidemic distress in Indian country in ways that are quite similar to historical trauma, as you can start to see. Yet he didn't reference historical trauma explicitly, and I don't think he meant to reference it implicitly either. In other words, while he did have a very definite emphasis on the historical injustices of colonization, he had a decided de-emphasis on psychological factors such as trauma. In other words, this was more spiritual or even existential, if you will, than psychological or certainly clinical. Now keep these lessons in mind as we proceed here. In particular, what I want us to focus on for the moment is that there are clear claims here regarding the pathological process of distress in Indian country, namely that historical experiences of colonization have caused an epidemic of what mental health professionals refer to as substance dependence and other mental disorders. Um, for now, I just want to use this vignette as a jumping off point. We want to focus on claims about people and the world. So let's consider the differences between tradition and science. Crowding Thunder obviously offered a discourse of distress, one that's pretty familiar to most of us in Indian country. Um, and, uh, but it's important to acknowledge that this was an example of a native way of knowing or a native epistemology. It's an instance of traditional or indigenous knowledge, not scientific knowledge. And I have a definition of traditional knowledge here for you. Um, and you could look at it more closely in the handouts if you want from Wikipedia. But in short, traditional folk or indigenous knowledge is the historically accrued body of understanding maintained by a culturally distinctive people. So for indigenous communities, we have indigenous knowledges. Traditional knowledge contrasts markedly with scientific knowledge, which is, of course, the historically accrued body of understanding maintained by the application of a range of scientific methods to specific kinds of testable or empirical questions. Now, what exactly are scientific methods? It's a little challenging to try and encapsulate scientific methods that would co cover paleontology, particle physics, astronomy, sociology, but scientific inquiry kind of generically seems to involve the precise observer independent measurement of phenomena that are cumulatively and progressively employed to evaluate falsifiable theoretical explanations of phenomena. Okay? There are a few um, qualities that I just want to accentuate here. The most important quality of scientific knowing is that it's skeptical. Scientific knowing is about the skeptical interrogation of claims. In other words, the, the response typically is prove it. And the person who is making the claim has the burden of proof. We don't accept anything on goodwill or faith or persuasiveness. You have to show us with evidence that will surpass the skepticism that we have to persuade us different. In addition, we have these four associated qualities. Um, the only one I'll really highlight here is falsifiability. In other words, you have to make sure that your claims are specified in such a way that you can bring evidence to bear that will help us to figure out, well, is it supported or not? You have to, you have to frame your questions in such a way that evidence can help us determine whether or not we should accept your claim or reject it. Well, what does this look like a typical practice? I mean, most of you in the room, I presume, have been through um, some kind of uh, school or classes where you get this. So I won't go into this in any detail, but there's a nice sort of procedure that most scientists follow, particularly social scientists and health scientists who are asking the kinds of questions that um, are, are relevant to clinical service delivery. So I think there is, in most cases, a major difference between how community members in native communities would go about evaluating claims and how substance abuse and mental health researchers and social scientists would go about evaluating them. The key contrasts lie in the degree of skepticism with which claims are met and the concomitant rigor with which such claims are evaluated. So the implication, I think, is kind of profound. We want to think about it for a minute. People make non-scientific claims about everyday life all the time. We all do it in our everyday experience. Some of these will stand up to skeptical scientific scrutiny and win some validation, some of those will not. And scientists, as a general rule, do not accept as true the claims of traditional or folk knowledge unless or until they have been tested empirically and supported by evidence. Moreover, we have to recognize that it's entirely possible that scientific evaluation of some traditional knowledge claims will result in the substantiation of some of these, but also in the refutation of others. So even opening traditional knowledge up to scientific scrutiny means you have to be willing to open to the possibility that your claim may not stand up to that sort of uh, scrutiny. 
A big example of science versus traditional knowledge it goes back to Galileo, right, who was proposing uh, that their, the um, universe was heliocentric, that the earth and the planets moved around the sun. The Catholic Church didn't teach that at that time. It was dogma that everything revolved around the earth. He was put under house arrest for these radical claims, and in fact, um, um, uh, only later was validated. Um, there's a lot more to that interesting story, but that's a clear example of a scientific versus a traditional claim in which the evidence ultimately has persuaded us so that we don't even think that's much of a question anymore. Another instance, I suppose, bringing it home to Indian country, um, I don't know um, Navajo uh, culture and belief well enough to know how prevalent this is anymore, but it's certainly documented that um, epileptic grand mal seizures were understood, may still be understood by some Navajos to be a result of sibling incest. So when someone drops down with epilepsy, it's understood that the cause is that um, they or someone in their family has been incestuous. Well, medical science doesn't recognize that link at all. And in fact, um, probably if you were a clinician and you were trying to follow that way through Indian Health Service or something, you would uh, likely face some kind of scrutiny or censure. Um, so th the question I think this kind of uh, stuff leaves us with is, in light of divergent traditional and scientific ways of knowing, what are we to make of the colloquial claims about historical trauma from the perspective of a scientific epistemology? Well, I think, um, from what I can tell anyway, and the impressive presentations here notwithstanding, historical trauma has a way to go if it's to become more than a folk concept, concept and instead achieve bona fide scientific status. And again, I'm bracketing aside for the moment whether we want it to achieve bona fide scientific status, but um, if the question is how could it and what would it look like to do, I think it has a ways to go. First, it remains important, though, to acknowledge that I certainly recognize the promise of framing Indian distress in the way that historical, uh, the way that tra traveling thunder did, and the way that historical trauma does in, in part. Um, I think one advantage is it neutralizes the pathological paralysis experienced by distressed community members um, by reframing and contextualizing personal distress as stemming from shared historical oppression rather than personal failure. When it's, things are framed as personal failure, it's not clear where you go from there. But by reframing it, I can see that there's advantages in terms of motivating people to um, undertake the very difficult process of change. It also provides an alternative explanatory framework that counters the biological reductionism in psychiatry. Right? So um, Ethan was talking about the reductionist aspects of, of many sciences. I don't think science inherently is necessarily reductionist, um, but certainly biological psychiatry is reductionist. Um, and my sense is that appreciation for these advantages is in part what um, uh, motivates the enthusiasm we have among all of us today for these kinds of approaches. And yet, as I mentioned previously, Traveling Thunder did not reference historical trauma per se. And so on the basis of his manner of construing these issues, I want to briefly offer a few critiques of historical trauma before tracing out a series of next steps that proponents of historical trauma might take to establish the concept more scientifically. Now, I want to, before I move into the critiques, just say again as an aside, remember, this is a scientific exercise. So what that means is scientists are skeptics, which means that this is going to be an exercise in skepticism, right? Follow along with that. It doesn't mean you have to agree or, or adopt these, but let's follow along with the skeptical exercise just for the purposes of, of thinking through these issues. Um, one basic difference between... Um, Traveling Thunder's prototypical discourse of distress and historical trauma proper is that Traveling Thunder, as I said, was largely non-psychological in the discussions of these matters. He never used the word trauma, for example. While the proponents of historical trauma, especially the early proponents, tend to be health and mental health professionals who instead underscore and accentuate the psychological impact and clinical mental health implications of historical trauma. I think if you look back through your packet of uh, PowerPoints today and look at the presentations, you'll see lists of symptoms and associated um, uh, phenomena that go along with historical trauma that people are talking about, and they're almost all psychological. More specifically, historical trauma, or perhaps more technically the historical trauma response, is frequently characterized as a variant or extension of the form of psychopathology known as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, prototypical PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder um, has to do with events like combat or rape or other forms of natural catastrophe. And there have been a lot of discussion within the PTSD community about some of the limitations of this conventional way of thinking about PTSD. So there's been proposals of alternatives like complex PTSD or what's referred to as desnos, um, disorders of extreme stress not otherwise specified. 
And these have to do with variations on PTSD, like instead of like a one-time rape and then you have post-traumatic sequelae to that, this is what if you were um, you know, sexually molested for 10 years of your life. I mean, the consequence of that would seem to be much more far-reaching than a one-time encounter, no matter how horrific. Um, and in particular, historical trauma is taken from what I can tell, it's inspiration from really horrific historical events like the Shoah, or the Jewish Holocaust. Um, and I think as a result, there's this really distinctive emphasis on what makes it different than PTSD or what it result, resembles really an extension of PTSD in this instance. That is that there are collective, intergenerational, and cumulative effects that are as associated with historical trauma above and beyond what we normally think of with PTSD. Collective meaning that you've had these shared experiences of genocidal events in some instances, that they're intergenerational, that is there is risk for problems that are passed down through earlier generations, and that they're cumulative, that risk increases with subsequent stressors over time. And all of this has been, um, I think, uh, uh, distilled to a focus on the Native American Holocaust, if you will. Although I think we might want to find a different word than Holocaust. Um, for those of you who are raised Roman Catholic, right, Holocaust means a burning. And in the case of the concentration camps, a burning sort of applies. Um, but the burning metaphor doesn't carry as far um, in our sense as another word might. Now, there's no time for more than really a select introduction to, a f I'll just say, four areas of critique today. Um, and I'll move through these pretty quickly because I think, um, you know, the purpose isn't so much to dwell on these, but I do want to raise them because I think they're the ish kinds of issues that we're going to have to address if we want to move into a scientifically respectable um, consideration of this, pr of this um, particular construal. Um, the first set of critiques has to do with what I call the inherited problems of PTSD. Now, um, I've written a little bit about the history of PTSD and how it came about. And it's interesting when you peer behind the curtain for how the DSM comes together, because you can start to see what kind of forces go into how something becomes a bona fide psychopathology or not. Um, and when you do that, you find that there was a whole series of debates around whether PTSD ought to accept it and under what terms. And here are just five quick ones that are worth um, sort of reviewing. The first one has to do is, you know, is PTSD and, and especially the traumatic event that precedes it, the event it's itself or the reaction to the event. And so for a time it was, well, there are a certain class of events that are so horrible everyone would respond probably with distress versus it doesn't really matter what the event is. Some people are prone to it. And so, you know, if I have a pampered undergraduate who gets their first non-A from me, that they could have PTSD as getting a bad grade or something. I mean, is it in the event itself or is it in the reaction to the event? And there's some, uh, when it comes to Indian country and historical trauma, one question, I guess, by extension, is if everyone with native ancestry is assumed to suffer from historical trauma, then, of course, the concept loses its explanatory power. Um, someone brought up earlier, well, maybe these are just you know, normal reactions to really abnormal circumstances. But in fact, with PTSD, we know empirically that it's almost always the case that the minority of people exposed to different classes of events actually develop PTSD as a syndrome. So it's not, in fact, a normal reaction to most classes of abnormal circumstances. Rarely is the conditional risk above 50%. Um, a big question in the development of PTSD is, is this a truly distinctive psychopathology? When it was first proposed, Lee Robbins at Washington University of St. Louis and colleagues said, we don't need PTSD, we have substance dependence, we have depression, we have anxiety disorders of various kinds, panic disorder and whatnot, we don't need PTSD. And it was ultimately a, a political alliance which was able to get it, um, not on the basis of empirical evidence, but on the basis of mobilized politics to get it pushed through into DSM-3. Um, is it anxiety or dissociation at its core? So PTSD has some legitimacy as an anxiety disorder. It's very close cousin, multiple personality disorder, right, which is understood to be caused by chronic, horrible trauma, usually childhood trauma, has almost no legitimacy and credibility in scientific circles. Um, and, and finally, is it confounded with malingering? This is really a big one because since uh, trauma made its move into psychology back in the 1850s around train accidents in Britain, there's always been confounded between people who might have these problems and pe the same people who are looking for damages or reparations. And, um, and uh, big reviews of this, um, you know, Dick McNally at Harvard has suggested that it may be as many as 75% of Vietnam veterans who received benefits for PTSD never even saw combat. So it's a really difficult question, obviously quite sensitive, but one that raises some serious concerns. The point here is that there are these inherited problems from PTSD that historical trauma proponents are going to have to sort through because it comes along with uh, the, the trauma analog. 
The second set has to do with these rather elusive mechanisms of transmission. So there's a certain sense in which intergenerational impacts in a mundane sense are really commonly accepted. I don't think anyone disputes that you know, the children of child abusers often grow up to abuse their children, or the, ch the children of people who are depressed will grow up maybe slightly more likely to be depressed. That's an intergenerational transmission of risk for pathology that's commonplace and that doesn't really raise um, too many questions. But the issue here, from what I can tell in reading Maria and some other folks, is whether there's not in fact um, a much more captivating sense of intergenerational transmission, whether risk for pathology is raised for offspring independently of troubling first-hand experience, right? So it's not just that because um, your parent was traumatized, they're not that good of a parent, and they actually inflict trauma on you, and then you go on to uh, actually experience PTSD as well. It's if your parent had trauma and, is not, uh, and never inflicts trauma on you, does that independently somehow raise your risk for trauma if you do finally experience it above and beyond the fact um, that the trauma itself was in your experience? And so um, this is really developed, I think, from the intergenerational risk literature, um, which is a psychoanalytic literature predominantly, with Holocaust survivors. And the claims by psychoanalytic clinicians for many years have been that the survivors of the Holocaust have children who are seen to be at increased risk for um, uh, post-traumatic pathologies, even though they themselves never experienced the Holocaust or other direct traumas in the same way. And this has been labeled secondary traumatization the sense that your parents' trauma can somehow increase your risk independent of whatever you experience firsthand. Now, there are limitations of this literature, the biggest one being that they're mostly clinical samples. Rachel Yehuda that um, Maria talked about did do this interesting study in 98 where there were 100 adult offspring of survivors and what the results were, were in comparison to uh, matched controls, there was an increased risk for PTSD despite not having more trauma. So it's, that's really kind of interesting. On the other hand, um, Van Isgenhorn and colleagues in 2003 did a meta-analysis, which is kind of the best way in scientific circles to pool together as many studies as possible and find out what the, the, con the conclusions would be. Looking at 4,500 offspring of Holocaust survivors in this meta-analysis, they found that actually the children of Holocaust survivors are no less well adapted at all than um, children of other matched controls who did not experience the Holocaust. Either way, whether we find that literature compelling or not in empirical terms, we want to recognize that what then would be the mechanism of transmission for this secondary traumatization if we're to accept that as um, important here. Um, you know, we might talk about narratives, right? Maybe um, parents who've experienced these kinds of grandparents or passed down stories of the horrors of the past in ways that help somehow traumatize or predispose their kids to being traumatized in these ways. People hint at genetics, that somehow they're, that the trauma can uh, affect genes and genes somehow will pass this down. Certainly spirituality is a candidate. You heard in Indian country that these um, um, risks are transmitted that way. But the point here is that um, whatever we want to propose, it has to be much more clearly spelled out. And the historical trauma proponents will need to specify these mechanisms of secondary traumatization in testable ways. Or else simply retreat to the very more ordinary sense that, well, I mean, there is, of course, increased risk because the actual, you're, you're more traumatized if you're from a traumatized family in many respects. A third critique has to do with the unknown incremental validity. This is simply a fancy way of saying, what does adoption of historical trauma buy us in terms of increased understanding and intervention for distressed Native people? What do we get above and beyond what we already talk about in terms of substance dependence, um, depression, those kinds of things, as opposed to treatment as usual, for example, for clinical depression and so on? Um, well, we've already talked about the benefits of a historical contextualization that can help reframe client problems. We've talked about countering biological reductionism. But as Traveling Thunder, I think, demonstrates here, we don't need historical trauma proper in order to accomplish this. And so in order to establish the incremental validity, that is the extra bang for a buck, by moving to historical trauma, aside from all the things we already have a way of talking about, we would indeed undertake a, a number of things here. We want to um, obviously develop measures, but that's underway. Les Whitbeck's on that. Karina talked to you about different measures they've developed already and, and used. Um, and then you want to be able to see, well, does that correlate properly with uh, conceptually related phenomena using other kinds of measures and discriminate from measures that it should discriminate from in theoretical terms? Uh, does it adequately discriminate between distressed and non-distressed non Native people? Does it help us pick out people who really are at great risk for pathology and not people who are doing fine? In other words, historical trauma proponents will need to clarify empirically where the bang is for a buck in casting native distress in this way and devoting scarce clinical and research resources to it. 
Finally, I think we want to consider the questionableness of certain kinds of grief interventions that are often promoted as important uh, for addressing historical trauma. Um, from what I can tell, the healing strategies for historical trauma typically involve acknowledgement and expression of grief, plus, of course, a commitment to move forward in adaptive and healthy ways. But just as there's baggage that comes along with PTSD, so too is there a lot of baggage that comes along with established notions of complicated bereavement, or it sounds like prolonged bereavement might be the way that people talk about it now. The thing that's interesting about this, just like with PTSD, is once again we're back at psychoanalytic origins. And there's a party line here that's been passed down and in fact suffused throughout our society in some ways that um, we're all familiar with it even if we don't know it. That is this notion that unexpressed grief festers within us to yield pathology and therefore requires some kind of cathartic interventions through treatment um, in order for us to avoid the crippling effects of such grief. In other words, that there are these dangers of delayed or displaced grief if we don't learn how to cathart. Well, this is Freud, first of all. It's Freud percolated, however, through a whole bunch of popular culture over the past hundred years. So it's not pure Freud in that sense, although um, there are certainly psychoanalytic clinicians who would look to Freud directly for those kinds of notions. And it's very difficult since Freud, especially for clinicians and those of us in the human services, to imagine alternative modes of grief. But of course, there is a huge anthropological literature that attests to very wide varieties in bereavement experiences. Moreover, scientific study of bereavement and its treatment concludes that there are no especially reliable stages of grief that individuals normally follow. So if you're embracing a, a grief intervention, Many of these happen to be based on this notion that there are stages you have to, you know, anger, denial, you've probably heard of those. The empirical evidence is that that really is not necessarily how people grieve. Nor are treatments for grief demonstrated empirically to be particularly helpful. Um, Banana and other colleagues have done these big meta-analyses of grief interventions and are alarmed to find that in fact sometimes it seems to hurt some people more than it actually helps them. So we're left with these standard approaches to grief then, for which the empirical evidence is not very strong. And if there's not a strong empirical evidence for it, then my worry, when we think about the, the wedding of certain grief interventions to a treatment of historical trauma, is that in fact what we end up doing is engaging in cultural prescription for how Native people should feel and act that's based on a Western white way of knowing. More than from professional mental health discourse, that is, than from the local bereavement practices that um, most of our communities maintain. Also, what's important to note, I think that there are real alternatives to grief interventions. Think about what's going on in Canada now, right? A Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? That's a really different way of approaching how do you redress these kinds of historical issues than you know, learning to cathart your grief, or apologies and reparations, right? Or you know, sometimes just simply moving on, right, in constructive ways. So the point here is I think historical trauma proponents wedded to interventions based on bereavement theory and intervention will need to demonstrate empirically whether and how such approaches contribute to native wellness relative to historical trauma. I promised, um, oops, I didn't go there, sorry. Um, there we go. Um, next, empirical steps, right? So what would we do if we are committed to the idea of wanting to make historical trauma scientifically legitimate? Here's a list of things, right? Um, display evidence that historical trauma is implicated in native distress. And we've got that to a degree. There could be more of it. Um, but the important thing about this, that's the very first step. Because what that tells you is that native people in distress say that their distress is linked to, say that they are more likely to think about historical traumatic events or to characterize things in historical terms. Um, that may not, it's an empirical question, so we don't know, but it may not be anything more than that clinicians in Indian country teach our clients that they're historically traumatized. And so distressed people come to adopt or embrace a discourse, a party line, about, oh, well, historical trauma is why I've got my problems. And so when you ask them in a measure um, why they have, um, whether they think about historical events, and they say, well, I'm really distressed, and yes, I do, because it's due to historical trauma, that's not so surprising. So there's some stuff that has to be untangled there in order to sort it out. Um, and of course, then we would want to move to these other steps. What is the validity of historical trauma in relation to a range of conceptually associated and divergent phenomena? In other words, it shouldn't presumably relate to IQ, for example, but it should relate to probably PTSD. So you, you want to be able to discriminate and find concurrent validity between related concepts. You want to be able ultimately, of course, to discriminate between Native people who do and do not suffer from a historical trauma response by whatever criteria we end up developing. If it doesn't do that, there's really no hope for it. If everyone has it, 
then there's really no hope for it, scientifically, that is. Three, document increased risk owing to secondary traumatization, right? Be able to show that there's such a thing as secondary traumatization. Here's how it works. Four, develop distinctive and specific treatments for it. And five, demonstrate the efficacy and effectiveness of these treatments. Now, I've talked today about the proponents of historical trauma. And I suppose that leads you to wonder if I'm a proponent of historical trauma. And in fact, I, I'm not sure I am, not yet anyway. And I don't consider myself a, historic, uh, a proponent of historical trauma as currently conceptualized for one really important set of reasons. And I'm not even sure that scientific status is what we ought to be looking for for this. That reason boils down to the fact that, as far as I can tell, historical trauma has been adopted and promoted by mental health professionals. Indeed, in some very important respects, historical trauma originates from psychoanalytic clinical practice. In contrast, really, to the way that Traveling Thunder discussed Native community problems, historical trauma has the potential to affect what um, Alan Young and others have referred to as a medicalization of the social. A medicalization of the social. This medicalization of the social is, in fact, a conceptual sleight of hand, or perhaps what we might call a sleight of mind, in which attention is displaced from unjust and oppressive social relations in need of radical reform to the difficulties of deficient individuals who require clinical management and attention. In other words, it's an old Jedi mind trick, essentially, what critical theorists would refer to as mystification, that serves the status quo. The depredations of colonization, some of which are ongoing, as everyone here today acknowledges, actually are then somehow magically transformed into clinical conundrums to be resolved by mental health professionals through cultural competence and a host of other ways to try and get clients more engaged and benefiting more from therapy. And so, let me say, I'm going to warn you, this is really provocative. It's deliberately stated provocatively. Are you ready? So, instead of radical social change, we get a cottage industry of counselors and therapists, most of whom in Indian country are paid from government monies, whose job is to tinker with the attitudes and behaviors of individual Indians, most of whom in Indian country are not almost ever really obtaining treatment by choice, toward improved functionality in an unjust society. The end result, right, of any kind of clinical intervention along those lines is victim blame. That is the very thing that we all, and I include all of us who have spoken here today because I know all of us are concerned about the potential to pathologize people through the things that we're engaged in, that we're all trying to escape, get away from pathologizing, get away from victim blame, get away from locating the source of these kinds of problems inside individuals. But we can turn back to the classic article by psychologists Kaplan and Nelson uh, 25 years ago about the person blame causal attribution bias in psychological research on social problems. And essentially these authors criticized, quote, the tendency to hold individuals responsible for their problems by two mechanisms. First, by focusing on person-centered characteristics, those that lie within the individual, while ignoring situationally relevant factors, that, are, that is, those that are external to the individual. So, in many respects, by making this a clinical problem, we end up being uh, the dyadic engagement of a professional with someone who's suffering in the effort to help them change to become uh, better adjusted and more functional in the world. And um, Kaplan Nelson concluded that these kinds of person blame interpretations ultimately are in everyone's interests except those subjected to analysis. So I guess what I would like to see is if we can't find a way to return to more to something like traveling funders emphasis on the community, history, and spirituality, minus the psychology, the clinics, the human services, and the mental health professionals. In sum, I think that we need to be more imaginative in our consideration of the damaging legacy of Euro-American colonization in our communities, which certainly persists to this day. But we've got to do so in a way by putting our heads together and figuring out how do we get outside of this paradox of ending up back in the clinic, back in our psychotherapy and human services, back in our victim blaming approaches that actually don't solve the problems that they're designed to, to um, resolve. Thanks very much. <laughs>